Okay, so we started this in in lecture um, yesterday, but or Tuesday, um, but I wanted just to kind of review it quickly for those of you who either weren't there or um, that aren't those of you who aren't going to be in class on Thursday. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you guys about what we're working towards talking about is uh, DNA replication. And so as we all know, DNA is the molecule that holds all of the instruction for all living things. And DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. It's a type of nucleic acid, which we learned about earlier in the semester when we talked about biomolecules. DNA is a double-stranded molecule, so it's got two strands and they connect in the middle, as you can see on that picture there. So the structure of DNA is what I talked to you guys about and how that, how that came into being, how we kind of figured this out. I t gave you a little bit of history on that in, in lecture yesterday. But um, the, the form or the structure that the DNA molecule takes is referred to as being a double helix. And it's sort of analogous to a spiral staircase. And so that double helix is basically made up of two strands of uh, nucleotides. So a nucleotide is the basic, the building block, if you will, of the nucleic acid. And I'm going to show you a picture of a nucleotide in a minute. So as hopefully now we know, we know that, uh, I'm starting over here, we know that DNA is the double helix I just mentioned, and that each chromosome is essentially one big long DNA molecule, and all of the genes for all of our traits are the functional regions of this DNA. So we have these these coding regions, we can call them, of DNA, and that's the, that's the part of the DNA that directs for the production of proteins, which essentially is what genes do. So that information is found on each of, each of our chromosomes. So we know that we have chromos pairs of chromosomes, as we've talked about before, and those chromosomes are found in the nucleus, and that each nucleus contains, of all cells, I should say, contains an identical complement of chromosomes in two copies. So each copy is referred to as a genome. And of course, the human body is made up of trillions of cells. And so what we're trying to ultimately work towards understanding here is, is what's going on with DNA and how, how, do the, how do these messages get extracted from the DNA molecule and ultimately direct for the production of proteins. So this is what a nucleotide looks like. Nucleotides are the repeating unit of the DNA molecule. So a nucleotide would be kind of what you see in this little dotted, in between this dot, these dotted lines here. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group represented by the yellow square, a nu uh, sugar, pardon me, represented by the blue square, and then a nitrogenous base. And those in, the, in DNA are represent, represented by one of four letters. In this case, you see the T for thymine. So Basically, what DNA strands are, are these strands of nucleotides all linked together. So where we, so, so you basically are seeing one strand here and you're seeing one strand here. So if we were using our analogy of the spiral staircase, the, the rungs, the things you hold, on, the, the rails, I should say, the things you hold onto on either side of the staircase would be this, and we refer to that as the backbone. And so the backbone of, of DNA is made up of phos group, you know, phosphates and sugars all sort of bound together. And then the rungs, or the steps that you step on, are made up of these bases. So we would have, in a DNA molecule, you would have your phosphate sugar linkage here, your bases, and then on the other side, facing the same direction, you'd have another strand of the phosphate sugar linkage, and then your bases this way. And the bases form together, bind together, um, in a complementary fashion. And that nature of how they fit together, that was the, that was what kind of, um, that last little bit was what Rosalind Franklin realized when she took that picture that we saw in class on Tuesday, photo 51. So this has been, you know, a big deal, figuring out what really is going on in the human genome. And this Nature article was placed, was published in um, February of 2001. And that's when we we completed the human human genome project, 
And since then, we've continued, to, and, that was, and the Human Genome Project was to, to sequence the human genome, figuring out what's going on in there in terms of genes, um, which was a big deal. And since 2001, you can see that we have since sequenced, you know, almost four, probably more now, like 14,000 or more spe different species genomes. And of those 14,000 or more, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 of them are eukaryotes. So we've got all sorts of genetic information now, which is, is a huge step forward. Okay, so back to those uh, nitrogenous bases. So DNA, in DNA, we find four, four bases. And as I said, they bind in a complementary fashion. So the way they, the, the, when they bind together, we call that a base pair. So we have four potential bases, and you're gonna want to know all four of them. The first one is adenine, and it's generally abbreviated with an A. And adenine binds to one base only, and that's thymine, and that's abbreviated with as a B. So you can see here we have our adenine, and we have our thymine, and then we they're bound together, and they're bound together by hydrogen bonds, which are structural bonds, you know, more like attractions, but not particularly very strong. Then our other base pair is is guanine, which is represented by a G, and cytosine, which is represented by a C. So guanine and cytosine are going to bind together, and you can see them doing that as well here, and they're held together by these, these dotted lines here are hydrogen bonds. So adenine always binds to thymine, and guanine always binds to cytosine, or cytosine binds to guanine, and thymine binds to ad adenine. So those complementary portions of the DNA molecule fit together kind of like a puzzle. And it's important that they bind just the way they do because it makes it so the, the molecule itself is uniform in shape. All right, so remember those A, T, G, C. That's going to become important to us. So because DNA is a double helix, you, if you have one strand, you would know what would be on the other side based on these base pairs. All right, so as I said, the two strands are complementary. So if you know what half of the molecule is, you can build the other half. And you know that because you would just attach, you know, the appropriate base pair. So essentially what we're working towards is understanding how DNA gets copied. Remember when we were talking about cell division, I said that prior to cell division that all that DNA has to get replicated. So basically what has to happen is your DNA molecules have to unzip and then copy. The strands get copied, so you'll have basically two identical copies in the in the molecule before it before it divides, or if you only need a little part of it, you would just unzip one part and copy one part. So when you when the DNA molecule unzips, and it unzips with the help of an enzyme, an enzyme comes and it basically is like scissors and cuts up those hydrogen bonds, and it's, it unzips just like a zipper would unzip. It unzips those two strands. You can then use each strand as a template to build a new strand following the base pair rules. So for example, if you unzipped and you had a thymine, you, could, you would know what would go across from it. If you're building a new strand, you'd put an adenine there. And then of course the phosphate and the sugar is always the same. So you can use that sequence, provided you know your base, pair, pair, base pairing rules, you can use that sequence to build your complementary strand. So in the, once if you were replicating the entire chromosome, let's say, the, all the DNA in there, then at the end you would have you know, you start, if you started with one DNA molecule, two strands, after you unzip it and replicate it, you'd have two double-stranded DNA molecules, right? So you have copied everything. So here's kind of how this looks. So during DNA replication, a cell is going to copy all of its chromosomes. It's going to duplicate it. So this is our double, our original DNA molecule right here. So basically you can see these, this is getting unzipped, right? It's getting separated. It's getting unzipped. And then we're going to build a complementary strand based on, based on these, these original strands. So essentially what happens in this process of replication is we start with one molecule of DNA, we unzip it, we conserve those two original strands, and then you 
build off of those two original strands. So we call this, we say that this process is semi-conservative because one of the new, so now if you, when you have two new DNA molecules, one strand in each of those two molecules is from the original parental DNA molecule and the other strand is new. So we conserve one strand in each one of those new DNA molecules. So here's a little animation that you can see. I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to hear it, but you can see it and it's kind of cool um, just to watch it go. So um, let's see if it's gonna go here. Oh, oh yeah, here it goes. So it's Before each cell divides, it must copy its genetic material in a process called DNA replication. Understanding of DNA replication comes largely from studies of E. coli, bacteria that are found by the billions in your large intestines. Let's take a look at how DNA replication occurs in an E. coli cell. So we're going to look at it in a bacteria, which would be similar in, in any other cell as, as well. So there's the, the DNA, the two strands of DNA separate. and there so are the DNA strands the are strand. separating. The result is a replication bubble. The bubble grows in both directions, forming two replication forks. Let's zoom in on one of them. Many proteins work together at the replication fork. Only some are shown. Here, the DNA is unwound, and DNA polymerases shown in orange, build new strands of DNA. Original parental DNA strands are shown in dark blue. Newly formed DNA strands are shown in light blue. Because strands in a DNA double helix run in opposite directions, the new strands must be made in different ways. One new strand, the leading strand, is built continuously. The other new strand, the lagging strand, is built in pieces. First, let's focus on the leading strand. DNA polymerase builds a new strand of DNA by adding DNA nucleotides one at a time. Each new nucleotide must pair up with its complementary nucleotide on the parental strand. Adding new nucleotides works the same way on both the leading and lagging strands. Each piece of the lagging strand begins with a short segment of RNA, shown in red. A clamp surrounds the RNA and attaches to DNA polymerase, which builds the rest of the new piece as DNA. When the piece is finished, it is released from DNA polymerase. How are pieces of the lagging strand joined together? A different DNA polymerase removes RNA and replaces it with DNA. However, it cannot finish connecting the pieces. An enzyme called DNA ligase joins the pieces together. Growth of the leading and lagging strands continues on both sides of the replication bubble until there are two identical DNA molecules. Although bacteria are very different from humans, the process of DNA replication in bacteria is similar to what happens in your own cells. So it's kind of complicated. Um, the, all that leading and lagging strand business, which you don't have to remember. I just kind of wanted to give you a visual to see how it works. It's, there's a lot involved. All those big globular structures were enzymes. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme. DNA ligase is an enzyme. So those are all enzymes that are there, obviously, to serve different functions. And in this case, the function is to 
to build to first unzip that DNA molecule and then to build to build two new two new strands off of those original DNA strands. You don't have to worry about you know the the lead, leading lagging stuff that gets a little bit complicated, um, but just sort of be aware of the fact that there there are enzymes that unzip it. There are enzymes then that attach the new nucleotides to the original str the original strands of the DNA. And then when it's all said and done, you have essentially complete replication, right? And you have two new DNA molecules based on that one original molecule. So DNA is going to be responsible for directing the production of proteins by our cells, and if you remember, proteins are made at those organelles called ribosomes. So DNA directs the production of proteins, and it does that in a way um, that involves an intermediate molecule, which is called RNA. So RNA is the other type of nucleic acid, if you recall. It's called ribonucleic acid, so it's very similar to DNA, but it has a few major differences. One is the structure. It is single, it's a single-stranded molecule, where DNA is a double-stranded molecule. So RNA is a single-stranded molecule. The sugar is different in RNA. In DNA, the sugar was deoxyribose, and in RNA, the sugar is ribose. And then the third major difference is that there's a base substitution. So in RNA, there are four base possibilities as well, and they pair by base pair rules, similarly to that which we discussed in DNA, but in RNA, rather than having thymine as a base option, instead we have uracil. So with RNA, we've got adenine binding to guanine, I should go back, adenine binds to guanine when you're building an RNA, when you're trying to, to make an RNA molecule, and um, or I'm sorry, adenine binds to uracil. I'm confused. Um, adenine binds to uracil and cytosine binds to guanine, same. So instead of AT, it would be AUGC. So the base pairs are, they are gonna, they're gonna link up in the same manner, but wherever you would, in DNA, wherever you would see a T, you would instead put a U. So it's a little bit different. All right, so basically, when we talk about DNA replication, our first option is to look at what we just saw, which is when we replicate the entire DNA molecule. Now, if a cell is just trying to um, make a particular protein, they are not going to, we're not gonna need to replicate all of that genetic information. Instead, we're going to only need a part of it, the part that codes for the production of this particular protein. So DNA is said to act as the molecule of heredity because it's responsible for directing for the production of all of these proteins. So basically what's gonna end up happening, and we refer to this as the central dogma of biology, which is that DNA directs the production of RNA, and then RNA ultimately is responsible for the manufacture of proteins. So the flow goes from DNA to RNA to proteins. And then of course the proteins are going to perform the function, cellular functions, that control all these physical traits that we've been kind of looking at. So the flow of genetic information, if you will, would be from the organism is of course made up of many cells and all of the cells contain the chromosomes and chromosomes are made up of DNA. So what's going to happen if you're going to just make a protein, let's say like a hormone, for example, we need to make a specific hormone. So basically our DNA molecule houses that information and all other information as well, not just that information. So basically what we want to do is we want to extract that little bit of information that we need for on whatever chromosome it's found for the protection of that particular protein. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to copy some of this information from the DNA to a strand, to a, to a molecule of RNA, and then that RNA will leave the cell nucleus and it will find its way to a ribosome and it will ultimately be involved in the production of the protein. So it's like the information is in the DNA, but it has to 
it, which is of course in the nucleus, but it has to get out of the nucleus in such a way that it can actually be read by a ribosome to make a protein. So what we're going to look at in the next videos are the how the process of actually getting the DNA to the RNA and then making the protein. And then of course the protein controls all those physical traits that we've discussed in the past. So that's the that's essentially how it goes. So again, the flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein essentially is going to be accomplished in a couple steps. So we know that that genetic information, the DNA is in the nucleus. And as we've said, we want to keep it in there. You do not want your nucleus, your nucleus, the information in your nucleus flo floating around freely in your cytoplasm of your cell. It's safe in here. We want to keep it in here, but we've got to get the information off of this DNA molecule and get it to a form that can leave the nucleus so it can make a protein. So the process by which we copy information from the DNA molecule and build an RNA strand is called transcription. So we're going to copy that information and we're going to build a single stranded RNA molecule and that single stranded RNA molecule is going to leave the nucleus. It's going to squeeze out through those nuclear pores that are in the nuclear envelope and it's going to find a ribosome. And that, that RNA strand is going to wedge into this ribosome in between these two subunits of this ribosome, it's going to get red. And so we call that process of the RNA molecule being basically read by the ribosome as translation. And based on that, we would build a protein. And of course, there's lots of details in between each of those steps. But we call the, so we say the way that we can basically extract information from DNA in order to make proteins is a two-step process. The first step is transcription, which happens in the nucleus, and it's the copying of the information, some information from a DNA strand, and making an, an RNA strand. So it's basically the transcribing of the message, and then that the, this RNA molecule, which we refer to as messenger RNA, it leaves the nuclear envelope, nuclear nucleus, pardon me, through the holes in the nuclear envelope, and it gets translated by the ribosome. As it's translated, what that's ultimately going to involve is it's going to involve a different type of RNA molecule that's going to bring amino acids back to this ribosome. Remember, all a protein is, it's a, is amino acids linked together. So each of these dots are different amino acids that are linked together. So in the next video, um, you're gonna, I'm going to run you through this. So I've broken this down into a couple lectures. So I'm going to stop here and pick up the next one.